I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're exploring a gripping historical novel. It is called A Step to Glory, America in World War I. It's written by a fantastic author and one of my favorite guests. His name is Sidney Phelps Little. His epic story follows four college friends and the 149th Field Artillery as they navigate the brutal battlefields of France during World War I. Join us right now as we uncover the real battles, the use of early airplanes, and the human struggle behind this compelling narrative. We're delighted to have this very talented author join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Atticus Publishing for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support authors like him by subscribing to our channel and by purchasing his amazing book. The links are below this interview. Sydney, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Well, it's good to be with you, and it's good to be able to talk about this story, which is a fantastic story and a gripping story uh, as we go through uh, and review World War One. Absolutely. And as the generations get older, the history of World War One is, you know, fading into oblivion in a way. I think yes, uh, we need reminders of the great sacrifices that so many made during the epic battles of World War I. And your book does just that by following the college friends and uh, their experiences. It's steeped in history, yet it's novelized, correct? Yes. Uh, one of the things that I tried to do uh, was the characters are sort of a amalgamation of different characters and their feelings, uh, it, I felt that it would be important that the true feelings of people as they confronted uh, what is a terrible war and the killing field, uh, what the reactions were and how they felt. I had access to a number of uh, letters and diaries written by those who were in the war. And so I tried to put it together. The characters, uh, are important in that they show the feelings of what they're going through as they watch these massive battles take place during the war. Letters and diaries are wonderful resources for crafting a book like this. Tell us how you got hold of those. Well, uh, there were a number of uh, research. I, I uh, wrote the book because I, one, my father, uh, I'm, I'm admitting my age, but my father was a uh, part of uh, Battery F uh, in World War I. And uh, because of the use of uh, gas uh, by the enemy towards the American troops, we felt that there was a, a, a residual uh, part of that gas that took him at an early age at 39. And I did not know him. So my uh, purpose in writing the book was try to get to know him. We yeah. shared genetic likeness. And therefore, I tried to put myself into his shoes and into the shoes of others so I could get to know him. And uh, as a result, I dove into uh, much of the history books, uh, reading as much history as I could and uh, trying to determine what this war was all about. Uh, as a result, some of the characters I created, one character was a professor at uh, the University of Illinois. That's where this unit was formed originally. Uh, and he, uh, prior to being called up himself into the war, he gave a dissertation to the students as to why the war was started and how it started, how the uh, uh, Archduke of uh, uh, Austria and his wife Sophie were killed by a uh, Serbian rebel, and it slowly evolved into a war: uh, Germany uh, against France, Britain, and Russia; Germany and Austria and Turkey. Uh, it was a true world war. Yeah. So I felt that uh, America did not enter that war until 1917. Uh, if you know your history, you will know that uh, Woodrow Wilson was president and he was elected a second time. Uh, and his slogan during that second election was, he kept us out of war. 
But what happened was that the Germans were sinking merchant ships and uh, not taking care of picking up uh, the survivors of those sinkings. And it resulted in many Americans dying. So he declared war. And as a result, the war started with America being involved. America sent, didn't send the first troops over to uh, France until sometime in July. I think it was the first big red division that went over. It was a makeup of both Army and Marines. Uh, the Rainbow Division had not been formed. And the University of Illinois had a National Guard unit, uh, which had a, a battery of uh, old-fashioned cannons. And they were activated and called the war. And from there, they were sent up to uh, Chicago. And there they joined the 149th uh, uh, artillery, artillery. Uh, field artillery unit. And from there, they went into New York. Uh, where the, the field artillery joined in with the uh, Rainbow Division. And from there, they shipped over to France. And in France, they had to go through training. You have to remember, this war was a war of both old and new technologies. Uh, the new technology that the uh, battery used were 75-millimeter uh, cannon that were developed by the French. And these cannon were rapid fire uh, cannon with breech loading of shells. However, the old part was they were horse drawn. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the cannon uh, and limbers were uh, hitched up to horses and they were dragged around by horses. Uh, the caissons were pulled by horses. So. Uh, we have a feeling of modern warfare and old-fashioned uh, warfare. Uh, it uh, After so I about one year of fighting, it uh, ended up in a stalemate. And that stalemate was a line of trenches that went from the North Sea to 475 miles to Switzerland. And it ended up in trench warfare, which was a dirty and rotten type of war. Uh, many soldiers died from disease. Uh, there was trench foot and so on. And this stalemate lasted. Uh, each side tried to uh, break down the other side. And it wasn't until the American presence in Europe that they started to uh, make movement in the war. And uh, this was uh, the Americans under General Pershing, Blackjack Pershing, you've probably heard of in history. So these are the, the things that came about and which drew America into the war. And it started us as a, a uh, powerful nation, and we were known of it. We were able to uh, have newness in war in that submarines were now part of the fighting. Airplanes were now part of the fighting. So it, it uh, turned out to be a, a, a nasty, dirty war. And so I tried to have the characters involved uh, as they uh, fought this uh, war and uh, a war of uh, slow movement. Yeah. It's an amazing story. Um, like you said, America was a relatively young country in those years, uh, and it was a time for it to uh, assert its world dominance in a way, uh, more than just being a world power, really. I think uh, America stood out as the most influential uh, country in the world, but thank goodness, because it uh, helped bring the war to an end. Yes, it did. And uh, the the problem is the war did not necessarily end. Uh, it was a uh, an armistice, and uh, in 1939, I'm afraid it restarted again. Uh, exactly. how, however, uh, the human sacrifice was great. Mm -hmm. As I said, the, the trench line was 475 miles long. Uh, also, uh, the human cost was in the millions. When you think in terms of civilian and uh, American casualties, and these are probably the things that I try to cover. Over 116,000 American troops were killed in that war. And if you uh, know uh, a, a 
about history, we only started fighting in January of 1918. Mm -hmm. uh, the troops were in France, but they had to go through training. They had to learn what was happening to uh, in the war and how to fight the war. So in a matter of 11 months, 116,000 Americans died. Amazing. So it, it, it was a, a tremendous expense of human life. Yeah. The uh, numbers are staggering and the toll on human life uh, persisted, uh, as you said, because of the gases used and so forth for uh, decades after. You started this uh, book in part as a connection to your father. Did you feel yes. connected with him while you were writing it, learning about the era in which he was a young man, an era, and the sacrifices yes, uh, he made for his country? Yes, uh, it did, because as I said, I didn't get to know him. And uh, it was through the writing of the book that I felt closer to him and got to know him better uh, as part of me and I as part of him. Uh, his life uh, uh, developed after the war. He finished college and then uh, went to dental school and became a dentist. But again, uh, the Great Depression hit uh, during that time. So there was a lot of stress on life and a lot of people at the, in the 30s. Yeah. Uh, so it, it was something that I needed to understand his feelings. I needed to understand how he felt about the war. And I think that uh, my study, uh, I hit pretty close to probably who he was. Yeah. Uh, he, he was a good, solid person. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I can see that in his son, no doubt. Yeah. Uh, tell us how your background as a flight instructor influenced your portrayal of aviation in the book. Well, I, I learned to fly way back in college, and uh, I became a flight instructor. I had my own business uh, up until uh, about 94, and then I uh, flew out at Kirtland Air Force Base as a flight instructor for a number of years. Uh, it's just that it's something I love to do, and uh, I, I probably thought that Excuse me, my father would have enjoyed that too, uh, being uh, genetically uh, tied together yeah. one way or the other. You know, one of the things that was important that I heard on the news the other day that they, uh, the World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C., is either now open or opening this month, sometime real soon. And one thing about it that uh, struck me was uh, it was in tribute to the loss of nearly 4.7 million or a uh, tribute to the sacrifice of 4.7 million Americans who served in the Great War. And it, uh, the memorial will feature a central sculpture titled A Soldier's Journey. Well, that's what One Step from Glory is about. It is the journey of soldiers uh, from the being a civilian, moved into the military through training, and then into the battlefields uh, as they moved around. Uh, it's interesting, too, of uh, so many animals were used to pull the wagons, to pull the uh, uh, artillery around. Uh, the artillery had been uh, developed by the Germans and the French uh, because of the animosity they had felt basically going all the way back through the Franco-Prussian War. Mm -hmm. And uh, on March, I think about the middle of March in 1918, the Germans opened an offensive to end the war. And they opened up on a, a morning with over 6,000 guns being fired. And... Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a massive attack, uh, which failed. Mm -hmm. But uh, this was how tremendous this war was and how it engaged so many people uh, as they go through. The, the aviation industry changed immensely. Uh, America did not supply much of its arms because they had not kept up with the German, the French, and the Russian. Uh, 
mm -hmm. uh, armies uh, who were constantly developing offensive weapons. So much of the uh, weaponry used by America was uh, given to them by the French and the British. Air, all aircraft were uh, foreign made. Uh, our airplanes were uh, such a, uh, of the right flyer uh, mm -hmm. where they laid out on a wing and uh, yeah. Were uh, totally unable to commit into uh, uh, into the fighting. The only uh, tractor, what they call a tractor style aircraft, is one where the engines in front was the Curtis Jenny, mm -hmm. uh, which many people have heard of. And uh, after the war, there were great surplus of them, and they were used for air shows and so on. So that's basically what what all of this is about. It's about men in war and the uh, the hardships that they in, in, uh, vision and see and come against. Uh, it, it involves injury and death. Yeah. Well, it's an amazing story. It's a compelling story. It's a real story. I know it's novelized, but these men represent, you know, thousands of men who, in many cases, made the ultimate sacrifice. We need to resurrect a young Gary Cooper and a young John Wayne and a young Randolph Scott to play the lead roles in One Step from Glory, America in World War One. What do you think of that as a cast? Have you well, envisioned this? It, it would uh, be one of much interest, but you got to find them. <laughs> exactly. Well, with AI, we can do anything. I'm sure they can take That's a true. data bank of John Wayne and make a composite of him when he was 25 and uh, cast him in the movie. But the serious question there, of course, is would you like to see this on the big screen? I think I would. I, th I think we need to see uh, the devastation that war brings to the land. Uh, we're still in a time where where war is uh, off in the distance, and we don't know what's going to happen uh, tomorrow or the, the next day. So uh, we need to be prepared. America needs to be prepared. Uh, as we go forward, uh, we need to be prepared with uh, armies that are ready to move into the field. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's frightening times what's happening around the world. We are, are, we are basically at war with um, Iran, you know, a proxy war in Israel. Absolutely. We're basically in war with Russia, a proxy war with Ukraine doing the fighting for us. So we are at war on two fronts right now. Just nobody admits it, unfortunately. So these are frightening time. We do need real life heroes. I got another guy for your movie, by the way. Uh, a young, who was I going to say? Errol Flynn, a young Errol Flynn. Oh, okay. Well, you're going back in time, man. That's, <laughs> that's back in my time. <laughs> well, I, he's still the best. Those All those actors are still the best. So uh, when we get what is good in our generation, then we'll replace them, right? Yeah, uh, it's it's interesting as to how the war developed and how it ground out and finally ended up in the armistice. And, you know, uh, the armistice was interesting because uh, on the 11th hour, the 11th day of the 11th month, it ended mm -hmm. and there was silence on the battlefield. And then people started coming out of the holes in the ground mm -hmm. and they started suddenly cheering and the uh, antagonists met in the center and greeted each other with handshakes. And isn't that something? That's that's a story that they didn't want to be fighting each other. People and, don't uh, hate people. Countries hate countries. You know what yeah. I mean? Yes. Politicians hate other politicians. Leaders hate other leaders. Um, it's a wonderful book. It would be a wonderful film. The name of the book is One Step from Gloria, America in World War I. It's written by Sidney Phelps Little. It is an epic story that follows four college friends and the 149th Field Artillery Unit as they navigate the brutal battlefields of France during World War I. It's an epic story. It's a lesson in history, and it's highly entertaining, and it is highly recommended. Sydney, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight.
Okay, just one thing. Uh, if if anyone is interested, I do have a website where the book can uh, have links to be purchased, and that's at uh, sydneylittle.com. Sydneylittle.com. We will have that below the interview as well. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. Okay, well, I thank you for listening to it. Oh, it's a true pleasure. To the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time. This time, until next time on Spotlight.